Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And it is a great morning. What is it? Like 75 degrees or something <laughs> outside? We're in summer mode. Yeah. Notice wearing my Hawaiian shirts. That means it's summer mode. So good morning. It's so nice up here. Those of you who are downstate listening, you know, it, where it's like 90 degrees, come on up. Come visit us. <laughs> But uh, it is a great morning, and just a couple quick announcements. We've got church barbecue and potluck coming up next Sunday, a week from today. Uh, church provides hot dogs, brats, and all sorts of things, the meat and drinks and good stuff. Just bring a dish to pass, and we should have a fun time. It'll be outside, and depending on how hot it is, we'll probably, we might have a campfire. We'll see. Uh, but anyway, there will be a barbecue potluck. So if you're on the island, Facebookers, YouTubers, if you're up here, bring a dish to pass. Next Sunday, that'll be after worship, and we'll have a great time. Speaking of barbecues, the one in July that originally was scheduled for July 4th, bad idea, because we have a parade and all sorts of things going on, and it would conflict and I know people like to be at the parade. So it's going to be one week later on July 11th. So our July picnic potluck, just like June, will be uh, a week later, July 11th. So mark your calendars, please. Please mark your calendars also for the first Saturday in August. We are doing the yard sale. And the week before that, the first week in August, we will be asking for volunteers to come in between 10 and noon, just a couple of hours in the morning that week, Monday through Friday, previous to the yard sale. And that's just to kind of distribute and price things. And, and the, the cool thing is, is that all helpers are eligible for, drum roll, pre-buy, pre-buy. So if you're a helper and you see that that uh, power tool, Samaya, you know, you see that power tool over there, you go, whoa, that would cost me $3,000. This is in great shape. Sometimes we get new things that are barely been touched, uh, but you get to pre-buy. That's the word for helpers. So anyway, just a little carrot there to uh, entice you. Uh, other things, just real quickly, dump days. Also coming up next weekend, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. And it's the usual place where what we've been doing, going down uh, the road from Sunnis and then cutting to the left. So dump days, don't forget about that. And if you do find some things that might move at the yard sale that are in good shape and, and you think might be good, uh, please just hang on to those things if you can. We're not good with storage here. In fact, our what little storage we have, we actually have some furniture and stuff already that had to be moved. So uh, keep your stuff, and then we bring all that to the church uh, the week before yard sale, the first week of August. So let's begin with a prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for all these opportunities to be able to praise you in everyday things, whether it's yard sales or barbecues or reaching out to people, reaching out to neighbors, friends, family, praying for people, being present in your love for people, especially this time. And we thank you, Lord, for just the opportunity to be able to worship you and to say thank you for family, friends, and the wonderful blessings that we enjoy and especially this beautiful day. So thank you, Lord, for being with us. Right on our hearts, Lord, right on our hearts, the message that we're supposed to hear today, a word, a phrase, a picture, something that will help us take one step forward more and more into the human beings you want us to be. So we thank you, Lord, for being with us. You are faithful and true. We love you. We thank you for this church family. We thank you for our human family on Drummond Island. We thank you, Lord, for this beautiful place. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 The one cool thing that we can celebrate above everything else is that God loves us every day, every moment, all the time. 
God loves us. Take it away.
We're going to be talking about a relevant, very relevant topic today on navigating a journey of grief and loss when we lose someone or something very dear to us and talking about that in some very real terms and how God fits into that. But this final song is probably that's what it's all about when you're going through tough times, especially when you've lost something or someone um, and something has dropped out of your life and you're changed. You're, you're a different person. And this is the prayer that we pray. shadow of death. Help us to know that we're not alone. 
Open every part of our senses, our hearts, our ears, our spiritual eyes. Help us to know that we have a companion who will never, ever, ever leave us or forsake us. That nothing can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. When we have no strength, Lord, open our eyes, open our hearts to you. Amen. Well, after last week's message, when the miracle doesn't happen, and the sense of loss and the hole that we feel in our heart, and all the other emotions that we feel when the miracle doesn't come through, at least the miracle we were counting on, faithfully, prayerfully, I got to thinking about it and I thought, we need to go a little bit further in this. And because there's, there's a lot that's been happening in our lives. We've experienced loss at levels that maybe we haven't experienced before as a community, as a global community, with the pandemic. And so much of what looked like normal life has been blown apart. And we still continue to feel the effects of that psychologically, emotionally, physically. And we're still in other countries we're praying for uh, India and, and South America and different places I guess South America is a continent isn't it? Uh, Brazil, other places that are really having a hard time and then locally it just seems like a lot of people have passed away in this last year it just feels like that we had a, a, a celebration of life service that celebrated three people who had passed away just in, within the last eight, nine months. And then this coming weekend with, the, with Dale Melvin's celebration of life. And just, I feel, I, I feel like I'm still in shock. I mean, because I just talked to the guy before he went for his surgery, his hernia surgery. And I, I still, part of my mind and body still say, Oh, he's just away, you know, on a vacation or something. Even though my mind knows, but emotions take a while to catch up. And so with, with grieving and loss, and, and some people have lost jobs, some people, I mean, high schoolers lost a lot of activities over the last year. Graduations were kind of, some of them happened, some of them didn't, some of them happened on Zoom whatever, but it, everything was kind of thrown into a, a real muddle, and we experienced ambiguity and chaos at some levels that we haven't experienced before. So I want to talk about that today. And, I, and again, just like last Sunday, I don't want to gloss over stuff, because sometimes religious people do that. They just gloss over things and, and kind of put platitudes, and we stick happy faces on them and just say, well, get with Jesus and, and move on now. And, and we don't want to deal with our own pain and, and much less theirs. And, and it just gets kind of complicated. But I like to take a look at finding our ways through grief and loss that are healthy and actually include that a spiritual dimension to it. Because there's always a spiritual dimension to it. But we want to include it because, so we can see a little deeper what's going on with that. So I've asked Vivian Seaman to come up and share a story with us of how her life was changed through the death and loss of her brother, Milton. And so let's give her some encouragement, guys. Vivian Seaman, here we go. Come on up and share a little bit. Yes, yeah, stand on the piece of tape. Excellent. 
Good morning, Facebookers, and good morning, all my friends and family in this church. I have to stop and say that how much this my church family means to me, and seeing you throughout the week, it gives me strength, and it builds a community where we can pray for one another, and remember the losses that they feel, and the pain that they feel. I love this church. We love you. Amen. Yes, we do. <laughs> Pastor wanted me to speak to, about my twin brother, Milton, who passed away uh, February 16th, um, 2016, and how I dealt with the grief. With Milton, it was more of a, just a, a huge loss because as my sister-in-law, his wife, who is also a twin, always called Milton and I our roommates. <laughs> and I loved him. I found out Milton was sick December 2015 and we had six short weeks together by phone mostly and I, we did make one trip down before he passed away to watch him being baptized at his church. And Milton, kind of lived a rugged, ragged life for probably the last 20 years he was alive. And, but he came to terms with what he did to himself, who was some of his bad habits. And he never stopped witnessing to everybody, the waitresses, the, the letter carriers, everybody. Mm -hmm. It was precious to see that because previous to that, one of the few memories that I had as a child with him was when we would stand in the Glen Ellen Bible Church. We were nine or ten, and I could always see Milton singing the hymn, Trust and Obey, and he sang it with all his heart. <laughs> but I learned to grieve probably 30 years before when my mother passed away in uh, 1988. And my mom's favorite song was 121. She always called it her traveling verse. And she always read that and prayed with us every time we left home. And of course, Al and I, living out in Newport, Rhode Island, were back and forth quite a lot for the three years he was in the Navy there while we were married. But 121 was what mom recited coming out of a what do you call it? Morphine stupor after surgery. <clears throat> and she had ovarian cancer. And she, she repeated it verse for verse because that was her favorite. Psalm 127 says, 121 says, I will lift up mine eyes to the mountains. From where shall my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will guard you're going out and you're coming in from this time forth and forevermore. So that's my traveling verse too. When we leave our children's home in San Antonio and Greensburg, Pennsylvania, it's always my prayer. But getting back to Milton, I, I thought of back in the time when, after mom passed away, and the one thing that sustained me is when I went out a few days after she passed away, and I looked up into the sky. I had been up the entire night reading all the cards and letters from her funeral, and there was a sky that, you, that only God could have sent me, a beautiful, beautiful, fluffy white cloud about five in the morning and the sun coming up behind it. And it just brought everything to me. And at that moment, I thought, 
My salvation has never meant more to me than this now, than this moment right now. Because I knew that the mom who I cried and cried over, I'd see one day. And that's what got me to the grave. So when Milton passed away, I remembered that precious time with the Lord that he reminded me, you're never alone and you'll see your loved ones again. It isn't easy. I don't pretend to know each of your individual stories. Death is hard, especially when you're so connected with a loved one. But that's what got me through, and that's what helped me to smile. Yeah. And that's what continually gives me the assurance that one day I'll see Mom and Milton again. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Deb. Grieving comes in all different packages. Because we're different kinds of people, our experience of loss comes out differently. And if I don't do anything else in this message, I want to give permission to those of you who are grieving or feeling loss. I want to give you permission, and I believe it's the same permission that God gives each one of us to grieve in your own particular way. Everybody's timing is different. The expression is different of grief and loss. The whole thing. And so there's no prescribed way. Even though I'm going to talk about some of the, some of the classical stages of grief and this and that, it's by no means limited to that. That there are other different ways to experience loss. And I'll throw in some other things, at least things that I've seen and things that I've experienced myself. Grieving the Bible happens. We see that happening. And typically, it's not just an individual matter, it's a communal matter that the whole town grieves, or the whole family and extended family grieves. And not just for an hour or two at a funeral, but for maybe a week or two weeks or a month, for a long period of time. We're not good grievers here in America, not really. Uh, other people, indigenous people especially, know how to grieve. And they do it as a village, as a group. And they find that strength and support and know that they're not doing this journey all by themselves. So I wanna to touch upon that aspect a little bit also. We'll, we'll kind of, that will come up as we look through different types of grief. And the Psalms, again, not only Psalm 121, but so many of the Psalms, in their raw honesty, are wonderful expressions and can be, in a way, a mouthpiece for our own grief and loss, reading the Psalms. One Psalm that came to mind was Psalm 42, from the sons of Korah. They were leaders in the temple and they would lead worship and they would compose songs and psalms and worship songs. And this happens to be one of them, Psalm 42. And I want to read it to you because it, it highlights so many aspects of an experience of loss at a deep level. So I commend it to you along with Psalm 121 and Psalm 91 and, and a lot of other psalms. But Psalm 42 says this, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all day long, Now where is your God? These things I remember, and I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go along with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with a voice of joy and thanksgiving, a multitude, keeping festival. Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? 
Hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. Oh my God, my soul is in despair within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of the Jordan, from the peaks of Hermon, and from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep at the sound of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have rolled over me. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and his song will be with me in the night, a prayer to the God of my life. I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of my enemies? As a shattering of my bones, my adversaries revile me. While they say to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you in despair, O oh my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I will yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. It's almost as if the worship song is a conversation, some sort of internal dialogue that's going back and forth. Where are you, O oh God? Why am I so alone? But I will put my hope in you. You're my rock. What's going on? Why am I so depressed? Oh, but I will look for the God of the living. And it's this back and forth conversation, which seems that happens in the times when we've lost something so deep. It's like this, these inner voices arguing. It's like this circus of sounds inside of us, emotional sounds. What's going on? Where's the ringmaster? <laughs> the animals are out of their cages. I mean, it, and it feels overwhelming. You could feel the over all your breakers roll over me. That overwhelming feeling, that feeling of powerlessness. What a great song. Trying to get a handle on experiencing loss. You look back to 1969, a psychologist by the name of Dr. Kula Ross identified five stages of grief. And I read, I read a recent article on grieving where the current research is, is where most researchers these days have kind of like pushed aside, you know, with all due respect, Dr. Kula Ross, pushed aside her five stages of grief because there's so many more. You can't restrict grieving, you can't restrict loss. Well, you can't restrict human experience to, to something nice and neat. I'm not sure that that was her intention, but, but the scientific community kind of glommed onto it. And so we're gonna look at those five stages and look at places within scripture where this might be reflected. And, and again, this is coming from me, so you can have your own opinion about it. Maybe some things will come to mind. But I think the Bible does teach us in some deep ways how to manage our pain. How to manage our pain. Because as my, my favorite uh, Catholic priest says, if you don't transform your pain, you will be destined to transmit it. <laughs> it's not a good transmission. So, and he also says almost in the same breath, good religion teaches us how to transform <coughs> our pain. Teaches us how to do that. And of course, we got the example of Jesus on the cross. But we have the example of Jesus every day, and we have the example of so many stories in the Bible that talk to us about real nitty-gritty pain and loss. And so Dr. Kubler-Ross's stages are denial and shock, anger, bargaining, depression, and then finally acceptance. Let's take a look at those. Denial and shock. Denial and shock. And, I, and I've seen this so much around me and in my own life where death is such a, a thief, such a thief. And there's something inside of us that says death is not fair. Death is not right. Death does not fit into 
the scope of real life. There's something about death that's such a cheater. And that's why at the end of the age, when God makes everything whole, that's one of the things that disappears. Paul calls it an enemy to be defeated. The last enemy to be defeated is death. No more tears. You can read Revelation 21. No more tears, no more sorrow, no more death. Just life. Now how God pulls that off, that's going to be interesting to see. But it may, I, well, I can't even imagine. Nothing but life. No more second law of thermodynamics, things falling apart. Everything just grows and becomes better and more livelier. That's amazing. But in the meantime, when death hits us, we're in shock. That's one of the, possibly one of the stages. Um, and especially if it's somebody we weren't expecting, you know, to, to pass, pass away. It's a shock. Even when somebody's been gradually declining. I mean, when Forey died at 102, I was still shocked. I, I went through that stage. I was. Because he went through so many, he survived so much stuff. And at 102, when he died in his son's arms, I was shocked. And there's part of that, a little denial in there and resistance and the whole thing, which is natural. All of these stages, all of these emotions are natural, are part of the experience. And again, it's like snowflakes. You know, we all have our own experience. And God says, that's okay. We'll walk together. I'm convinced that Paul's blindness in Acts chapter 9, one of the two places where he tells about his conversion experience, going from a Christian, a murderer, to a, a major leader in Christianity, a, a black and white, a major transition. And Paul talks about that in Acts chapter 9. And I'm convinced that his blindness was part of this whole shock kind of thing. Because Paul had lost his whole rabbi identity, protector of the faith, as he saw it before. He had put so much into making sure that religion was pure, that Yahweh, Yahweh's name was honored and protected. Every ounce of his being, that's where his identity came from. And these renegade Christians and these other heathen, these pagans, were, were putting God's face in the mud, and he was putting an end to it, and that was everything that he was. And then all of a sudden, he's riding on his horse, and Jesus appears to him and says, why are you hurting me? Why are you hurting me? And in that one instance, it's like it all comes in to Paul. The, the whole burden, the whole experience of doing this, and I've been doing it totally wrong. And it comes in on him, and he loses that part of him. And doesn't know where he's going to go. But he knows he can't go back there. He knows he can't go back. He cannot be the same person that he was. And in the experience of that loss, I'm convinced that that physical blindness that he experienced was part of that shock. Where do I go? My whole world has been blown up. And I am blind. The Holy Spirit leads us into all truth, John 16, 13, that God brings us into an experience of what really is in our time, in God's time, in the Holy Spirit's time. And that's part of what that commitment, that spiritual commitment to Jesus Christ involves. It's a commitment to experiencing reality as it is, but never alone. Second one is anger. Anger by itself, just like emotions, is not good or bad. It just is, okay? Uh, but we are warned in Scripture against murderous anger in Matthew chapter 5, in the Beatitudes. We are warned against an anger where we shut down our listening, 
where we're no longer connecting and we're building up fortresses and machine gun nests and stuff like that. That kind of anger, murderous, non-listening anger. But anger in and of itself is not a bad emotion. A lot of energy, but it's not a bad emotion. So we're warned against holding on to anger, holding on to something that could be destructive, any passionate kind of emotion that will lead us into some really poor choices, okay? But, the, but to hold that emotion and allow God to work with us in that emotion and not just suppress it and put it in the pressure cooker, but let the Holy Spirit, quote, lead us into all truth. Let the Holy Spirit transform the pain. And that includes the anger part and all the other emotions. To let God work with that palate. That's the point of this, is laying this all before God in our prayers. Bargaining. There's a lot of bargaining in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. And it's not judge. You know, it's interesting. There are a lot of things, a lot of human things in the Bible that go on and we go, we kind of rub our moral whiskers and, and we say, oh, I'm not sure that's real Jesus-like, you know, and we kind of stand in judgment over some of these Old Testament figures. But it's interesting that the Bible doesn't, and I don't believe God does. And bargaining's one of those. And there's one of my favorite bargaining stories. There's a number of them. I don't know what yours are. But Abraham and God, when they're arguing over Sodom, and Sodom is just, it's, it's a mess. Um, it's just a mess, morally, spiritually, human-wise. It's a mess. And there's going to be some judgment coming down, all this. And Abraham and God get together, you know, two, two good Jews, right? <laughs> And they're, they're bargaining this thing out. And Abraham starts out, he goes, well, what if there's 50 good people in the town? Will you spare it for those 50? And God goes, yeah, I'll do that. And then Abraham goes, well, how about 40? And God goes, I can do that too. And Abraham works his way down. Um, well, it's like 45, 40, 30, 20, 10. And it gets down to... 10, and Abraham says, how about just 10 people in the town? 10 good people. And God goes, yeah, I could do that, just following suit. And then it says, and then the Lord finished with Abraham. And I looked at that because I had talked to a rabbi about this particular passage. And I remember Rabbi Mark said, he said, you know, the, the rabbinical writers who write commentaries on this stuff, the rabbinical writer said that Abraham didn't go far enough. Abraham is the one who stopped the conversation. And I looked up the Hebrew, and the Hebrew indicates that, that it wasn't God who said, oh, stop the conversation, I'm only going as far as 10. It's more like there wasn't anything happening. And awkward silence or whatever was happening, and God says, well, I guess it's time for me to go. Abraham did not press it. And the rabbinical writers say, had Abraham said, how about five? God said, I will spare it even for five. How about one good person, one righteous person? Yeah, I can do that. How about if there are no righteous people? God, who sees all the time before him, looks down in what would be the future for us. He looks down and he sees his son bleeding to death on two sticks of wood. And God says, yeah, I can do that. That's one of our problems as human beings is we don't go far enough with God. We see human limitations attached to God and they aren't there. We don't go far enough. Oh, God has a limit. I, I remember hearing somebody say one day that God's grace has limitations to it. Uh-uh. I don't think so. I don't think so. So, bargaining. 
You tend to bargain with God. Oh God, I'll, I'll go to church every day if you just save this person, if you heal them, if you help them. I'll read the whole Bible through, including Leviticus, Numbers, all of that junk. I will re I'll read it in King James English. If you only make this situation better. Oh God. And we pray with faith. Depression, that's another one, possibly. A lot of depression in the Bible. <laughs> People are depressed. Even Jesus in the garden experienced a form of depression. I mean, like blood coming from his pores in the garden before his crucifixion. Deep depression, that heaviness. I mean, if there's an emotion that we all feel at times, it's depression for various things, for various reasons. Job, I think of Job, you know, everything's taken away from Job. Why do bad things happen to good people? Job steps up on the stage. Let me tell you about it. And Job, Job had everything taken away. His family died, all of his cattle and everything that he owned, all of his family, everything, even his health, sores and stuff, he's suffering. Everything is taken away from Job. And he experiences depression. And we follow that through, like, I forget, it's like 42 chapters in Job. I mean, chapter after chapter after chapter between him and his friends and what you do wrong, Job, you know, and all, and all this depressing stuff up until the very end. And Job goes, what's going on, God? The final conversation with God. I'll let you read it for yourself. But God answers in a way that Typically, Jesus would answer people, question with a question in a way. God says, did you make the earth? Do you have the depth to understand what true suffering is all about? Because I do. I do. The emptiness that we feel in depression, the powerlessness that we feel in depression is not bad. It's uncomfortable. Nobody likes to be powerless, but it's not bad. In fact, Jesus said in the Beatitudes, in Matthew chapter 5, basically, if you read through those Beatitudes, blessed are the blah, 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 if you read through that and see the common link, it's basically, blessed are the emptied ones, for they will be filled with the presence of God. Now, I don't know how that works, but I know that places where I felt powerless or the few places where I felt depressed, that there's an opportunity for me to feel the strong arms of God underneath me. I don't realize how self-sufficient I am. Oh God, I'm, I'm all yours, you know, surrender to you. But still, I'm self-sufficient. I'm an American, <laughs> I'm a human being. And those places where that self-sufficiency drops out, where we don't know what the heck to do, that's an opportunity. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Read them all. And then finally, for Dr. Kugler-Ross, there's this acceptance. Like Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about that thorn in the flesh. We don't know if it was physical, mental, spiritual, whatever. We don't know. It's probably better that we don't. But with something that he felt was holding him back, it was an impediment. It, it represented a loss of ability to really preach the good news, to be who he needed to be. This thorn in the flesh. And God says those great words, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Think about this. My strength is made perfect in weakness. There's something about acceptance where Paul accepts that thorn. There's places where people in the Bible accept 
what's going on with them. You think of Joseph's story in Genesis. Joseph, all the ups and downs of his life, good grief, thrown in prison unjustly, all this stuff happened. But wherever Joseph went, he prospered. And he prospered for God. And he made other people prosper. And uh, he, even in jail, even in prison, he didn't moan and groan. He, he became like the top administrator in the jail. I mean, it, people trusted him. He was amazing because wherever he went, he accepted what reality brought to him and knew that God would get him through, would give him the tools to make the next step, the next step, next step. Acceptance. And that's really where spirituality points us. That's where Jesus points us is to be able to actually experience life as it is, not as we would have it, not as we would fix it. Uh, ideals and goals are great, but to experience life in kind of what some philosophers call the eternal now, right now, in this breath, in this moment, to experience it fully and completely, whether it's happy, sad, light or dark, whatever, to experience it fully, that's your salvation. But to experience it fully means that you stay connected to the one who guides you and is with you through thick or thin. At least at some level, you trust, just like the psalmist in Psalm 42, my God, my rock, that you have some sort of sense, some sort of sense that there is one who goes with you. Yet yeah, don't do it alone. Other experiences coming out of it, of loss, you can experience gratitude for a life well lived, a sense of gratitude. Thank you, God, for this person's life. Even if the death was not the best, things didn't turn out the way that you wanted them to, to be able to have gratitude for that life. In fact, carrying on a legacy, oftentimes at funerals, I'll say, it's up to you guys now. You know, you hear all the testimonies of how this person was a family person and loved their grandkids or kids and loved fishing and enjoyed life with gusto. They weren't saints, okay? You know, they had their problems and all this, but there was something, there was a spark of life. And I say to people at the funeral or the memorial service, carry on that spark, be the spark. Be good news to people. Be life. Carry on the legacy and, and that sense of gratitude for somebody's life. And it doesn't take away the pain. That It's not a substitute thing where we replace pain and we just prance around and be happy. <laughs> but it's, it's somehow it coexists with the sense of sadness that may be there. It lives, they live together. <laughs> That's what being human is about. How about a sense of awe? Sometimes deaths, I mean, people who are right on the edge, you know, the liminal space, as it's called, that edge between the earthly world and the heavenly realm, and they're just kind of one foot in and one foot out, you know. And there's, there's an amazing, I don't know, sometimes there's an awesome sense. I've experienced that with people where I've sat with them, and they're passing over. It's, it gives me goosebumps right now. I mean, it's, there's a sense of awe. You're experiencing something deeper going on. It's awesome. A sense of relief, especially for people who have had chronic problems year after year after year and have suffered from whatever it is, whatever disease or ailment or whatever, that, that they're finally released. And you're finally released from worrying about them. You're released from worrying about them. You don't realize how much worry or anxiety or whatever you feel for somebody until they have passed away. You don't have to worry about them anymore. And there's that deep sigh, that deep sigh. Yeah. How about that experience? of wisdom. Psalm 90, verse 12 says, Lord, 
Teach me to number my days that I might apply my heart to wisdom. Teach me to number my days that I might apply my heart to wisdom. <clears throat> wisdom can come out of that sense of loss. It can connect you in more powerful ways to people around you. It can connect, connect you more powerfully to suffering around you. It can connect you more powerfully to God, to Jesus. Wisdom. So, I don't have a long list of advice or anything. I do have two things, though. As we kind of close this out, and I can feel the gears turning, and you'll have a chance to kind of reflect back on this too in just a little few moments after communion and such. But I'd like you to think about two invitations, because God always gives us invitations. He doesn't make us do stuff, it's our choice. But He lays the banquet out before us. And we choose to eat or not to eat. But I sense two invitations. Okay, ready? Number one, numero uno, is find your level of support. When you've experienced loss, find your level of support. Sorry, people may offer stuff to you or they may not. You know, here's a meal. Here's, uh, can I do your garden? Can I, uh, I had a guy after Barb died. He, he said, because I had a long intercessory prayer list, and he said, send me the list, and you don't have to pray. This guy, like, read me. You don't have to pray. I will pray your daily prayer list, your intercessory list. You're on vacation. And he keyed in to my just powerlessness I mean, you can't, when you're going through loss, or at least when I was going through loss, my experience is, is that you just don't feel like doing anything. People gave me books. I love books. People gave me books and pamphlets on grieving, you know. I couldn't read anything for at least a year. I couldn't do any of that stuff. But Jim, Jim keyed into that. And we just hugged and cried. He just keyed right into where I was. But that doesn't always happen. And so there's grief groups and all sorts of things. And I always say on the back of, there's a bulletin you know, for funerals. I always say, you don't have to do this alone. You don't have to go it alone. Now, sometimes you need to be alone. You need to process stuff. You need to go on a retreat. Just be by yourself, cry, whatever. But when you come to that place, or if you come to that place where you need some support, to find it in family and friends, people that you trust. Find support when you need it. And that level of support that you need. Again, the Psalms are great. Uh, the Bible has a lot of cool stuff in it. I mean, a few of them are like Psalm 73. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Psalm 73. Or Psalm 56. Record my misery. This is talking to God. Record my misery, God. Get going. You know, grab a pencil. List my tears on your scroll. Are they not in your record? God records our tears. Or well, at Psalm 56. Or how about, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Ever feel crushed in spirit? The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, saves those who are crushed in spirit. Psalm 34. Or how about Psalm 46? God is our protection and our strength. This is right at the beginning. God is our protection and our strength. He always helps always helps in times of trouble. And then, of course, a few verses on. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. A lot of stuff in the Bible. So find, 
find places in the Bible or you know get some suggestions other books other places but find your level of support if you're able to read if not fine listen to music music can be a great healer allow the Lord to heal you through music find your level of support that's number one okay and sorry you may have to take some risk in doing that find people who are grieving or let them find you or whatever and share your story, okay? And you may have to get out there and do it. That's number one. Number two is learn to listen to your heart. Learn to listen to your heart. Now, we're not just talking about individual heart beating or even your spirit, because oftentimes the Bible will equate the word heart with your spirit or the core of who you are. But the New Testament takes that further. In fact, actually the Hebrew scriptures take it further too, for that matter. Um, that, that heart is that place where you connect with God. That's your spiritual connection place. That's your spiritual connection place. And you can read about that in throughout the New Testament, all sorts of I don't know if I wrote something down. No, I didn't. But um, you read the New Testament. But it's, but it's that place where you connect with your deepest, innermost, who you are. Because that's what, a lot of stuff gets stripped away, right? When you experience loss. Something or someone is stripped away. And you have to redefine who you are. That's a process. So you connect with your spirit. And you connect with the Holy Spirit at the same time. And you begin to reassess. And you begin to listen in some new ways. To not only who you are, but the world around you. And the God who loves you. You begin to reassess that stuff. That's good. That's good. Even if there are question marks. Big question marks. That's good. But again, I advise... When you want some help or support, don't do it alone. You have questions, don't do it alone. You have, what am I doing here? Don't do it alone. Let people walk with you. Friends, family, neighbors, maybe even a pastor. Okay? So Ruth and I would like to play a final song. And it's a song that reflects a prayer, I think, a prayer that you could pray in different forms when you're going through a sense of loss. And I'd like you to pray it with us. It's called the Cares Chorus. And it's taken from 1 Peter 5, 7. 1 Peter 5, 7. And again, Peter is writing to people in the New Testament who are going through persecution. They've lost everything. They've lost their homes. They're hiding out in caves. They're having a tough time. And Peter writes basically a scripture that has been put to music. And it's just a simple little song. We're going to sing it for you and invite you to sing with us. It's called the Cares Chorus.
We're getting ready to do communion. It's just like what I said about the song, Draw Me Close to You. It really is all about communion. It's about that connection with God, connection with one another, and in essence, a connection with ourselves. That's what's involved in communion. So grab your communion cups. And those of you at home, if you want to grab a piece of bread or cracker and some grape juice or orange juice or wine or whatever you have, join us in communion and we will have communion together. And here's one for you, Ruth. I can already hear the cellophane going. You guys know the routine. So top cellophane off. We will eventually return to real bread one of these days. Uh, we might do this for like one more month and then go to real bread. You have to use your imagination with this little wafer. <laughs> So we, we celebrate the fact that Jesus is with us. One of the main things that he did on the cross was he says that death never, never, ever has the last word. That you may experience darkness and the valley of the shadow of death. Remember how Psalm 23 goes, but I am with you. I'm with you. And Jesus said his last words, he said, I'm with you to the end of the age. I won't leave you or forsake you. I am with you. And that God is with us. You can't go any place emotionally or physically where God isn't, where Jesus isn't, where the Holy Spirit isn't. And we celebrate that with these simple little pieces of semi-bread, cardboard, and, um, and this little grape juice. To remind us that his body is with us, that we're part of the greater body of Christ. And this little bit of grape juice reminds us of the blood, the life that he spills for us. But not just Jesus, but God the Father, who's been doing it for all of eternity. That God shows his love, spilling out who God is over and over again. Giving, giving, giving. Serving, serving, serving. Freely have we received and then we're challenged to give it away. So in celebrating Jesus' body today, celebrating the communion, the gift of communion that he gives to us, you don't have to earn it. You don't have to do be a good person, be a good boy or girl. The gift is still there. Jesus said the sun shines on the evil and the good. You know, God's love shines on everybody. It doesn't matter who you are. The gift is there of communion. So we say to God, I'll take it. So take the gift. So God pours himself out for us. The cross is the prime example of that, but Jesus did that every day in his earthly life. Poured himself out. He loves you that much. He really does. And so we celebrate that with this little bit of grape juice or whatever juice you have to symbolize his life just being poured out for us. And we're invited to do that with others too. To pour our life out for other people as God brings people across our path. To be good news for them, poured out over and over. Love, grace without limits. Let's celebrate that. So, thank you, God. Thank you that life is a pure gift. Though we work hard in this life, the real treasure is something that's right at our doorstep. Because you deliver. And you keep on delivering. So the prayer is the same as at the beginning of this service. Open our eyes, open our hearts to a new dimension of reality. Expand 
our perspective, expand what we see, what we experience. Show us the hidden things, Lord, that we're missing. And help us to do it together. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Facebookers, if you have a comment, feel free to leave a comment on there or an experience that you've had. Uh, just tap it in there uh, or email us and let us know, you know, how this has affected you. Thank you so much for your support, both prayerful and financial. And again, you can go to our website, www.lighthousechurchdrummondisland.com and find a giving page and announcements and all sorts of things that are going on. If you're with us up here on the island, come on in, join us. We'll leave the light on for you. We have really good coffee too and hot chocolate. So uh, come and join us. Thank you so much. God bless you. And if you're here next weekend, we'll see you at the barbecue.